on fire with the Spirit of God. People come to see what's going on. People want to know what's going on. And they look and they observe and they go, wow, it's amazing. And, and the problem we have is too often we, got, we walk around with squirt guns aimed at ourselves, And we keep trying to put out the fire. And, and the only squirt guns we should have would be those bottles that are filled with the holy water of God that's pouring into us life. And out of that life is coming fire that comes from heaven above. And so we're going to be talking today about what does the Holy Spirit do. And we're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture and, and these passages of Scripture are from John's Gospel, John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. And it's really a cool passage. So this first passage that we're going to be looking at from John 14 is when Jesus first introduced to his disciples. He's, well, I shouldn't say first, but he introduces the disciples, the Holy Spirit that's going to come and what the Holy Spirit's going to do. And it's, a, it's an amazing passage because at the start of John 14, Jesus talks to his disciples and he says to them, he says, now, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I may also be. And they're like, Jesus, we don't know how to go. Jesus sets the, sets the stage. He says, okay, listen, guys. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to my Father's place. There's been lots of rooms there. And, and I'm going to be preparing a place for you. And where I am, there I want you to be as well. I want you to be with me. And he sets the stage. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And if you know me, you know my Father as well. And then he goes on to tell them, in John chapter 14, he describes to them this advocate that is going to come, the comfort that's going to come, the Holy Spirit. And then in John 15, he describes the fact that, by the way, in the midst of this great sermon that he's preaching to the disciples, he says, if you want to bear a lot of fruit, you've got to stay connected to the vine. And if you're not connected to the vine, you're not bearing fruit. It's pretty simple. If you don't have a good root structure, you have nothing. And then... John chapter 15, he again describes more about this work of the Holy Spirit. But here's a really interesting piece. is in the midst of all this, Jesus knows that he's getting ready to leave this earth. He's going to be crucified on a cross. He's going to raise from the grave. And he's going to be going to heaven. He knows he's going to leave. And so he wants to tell everybody all that they need to know before he leaves. If you've ever walked the journey of life with someone that was dealing with a terminal illness and they were preparing to die, you think about that. So I'm just going to share a brief story, okay? So a little over a year ago, two years ago, I, three years ago, wow, time flies. So about three years ago, one day Pastor Brad and I were here at the church and we went from the office, we were going out to get a cup of coffee, you know. I, I get coffee or something like that. I just fill up a cup and Brad, he has this little ritual he does. You know, he takes his cup and, and if you look around the coffee thing out there, on most days there's a little white cup back in the one corner and in that cup is a used tea bag and Brad will get that used tea bag out and he'll put it in his cup and then he'll add some hot water and he'll dunk it around in there and work it and work it and dunk it and, and then he'll take the tea bag out and he'll put it back in the cup and then he goes over and he'll put a little honey in it and he'll stir it up and then he puts some cold water in it. I'm like, Brad, you just made it hot. No, it's just too hot. I want it. So he puts a little cold water in it. And so he was going through all these little rituals and stuff and I have some coffee and, and Rob Knopfsinger, Rod and Sandy's son, was dealing with a terminal cancer in his body and he'd been taking treatments and he came walking in the door and he came over to the coffee bar and, and he sat on one side on the, on the work counter there and I sat on another and, and Brad was leaning up against the side and Rob said, you know guys, I just want to tell you, he said, uh, I'm not going to do the treatments anymore. I just can't do this. I, I feel like the years that God has given me are good. The years God gave me are enough for me to have done what he wants. He's given me a good life. He's given me the ability to do lots of things. And I just want you guys to know for me that I'm okay with that. In fact, I know that he's got some good stuff in store for me even moving forward. And I'm ready for whatever it is that he wants to give me. And so for the next about an hour or an hour and a half, Rob talked with Brad and I about what he wants to do in these last weeks, months. He didn't know how much time. He said, if God grants me five years, that's awesome. If God grants me six months, that's awesome. And, and Rob had about three or four weeks. Rob said, in this time, I want to make sure that I have a clear mind that I can share with my friends and my family, the God that I serve. And I don't need all the medication. I just want to focus on my relationship with him and making sure that all those around me 
understand how important that relationship is and what that means. Well, that's like this passage of John 14 where Jesus says, look, I'm getting ready to leave, but I want to tell you the things that are really important that you got to know. And so today we're going to be talking about, and I want to talk about what it is that God wants us to know as we live these final days, however they are. And I can tell you too, um, I discovered something this morning, and again, I, I'm not always the sharpest tack in the drawer, and I, I know that it, it doesn't bring me too much discomfort, but this week as I studied and worked really hard on this sermon, it felt like the last couple points were actually a lot of work, and just I was here yesterday for like seven hours working on that, and this morning I woke up, I, you know, all week I was thinking about communion, and I was thinking about sermon, but I never brought the two together that we have to fill, that, that's going to take up our whole morning, and so we're only doing the first two points of the sermon today because the other two are going to have to be for next week so we have space for our communion. So if you wonder where we're at with our notes, just save your paper and we'll do the other two notes next week. So this week, starting with verse 14 of John, chapter 14 of John, verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and he will come to him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. And if you love me, you would be glad and I'm going to the Father. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. And then chapter 16. Chapter 16, starting with verse 5. Now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your goodness, for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you. More than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. What does the Holy Spirit do? It's a question that we often wonder. In fact, oftentimes we get confused and we wonder, what is the Holy Spirit really trying to do in our lives? And... And so today I'm going to talk a bit about that, and in a few weeks we're going to talk about what is our response supposed to be to the Holy Spirit. The first, one, the first point is this, the Holy Spirit convicts the believer's heart. So he says it this way, I'll read the verse again, he says, But I tell you the truth, it is for, a, for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. 
But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgments. One of the big pieces of the work of the Holy Spirit, and obviously I can't touch on everything the Holy Spirit does today or next week. It's something that just encompasses so much of our life. So I'm just I'm highlighting a few of the pieces. And so today I want us to recognize, first of all, that the Holy Spirit, one of His job is to convict the believer's heart of sin in their life. The Holy Spirit removes all doubt in our mind that we have sin in our life. We can fool people. We can put on our masks. We can put on our makeup. We can put on all kinds of fancy clothes. We can do all kinds of stuff make ourselves look like this beautiful thing on the outside. And on the inside, we're filled with turmoil and difficulty. And the Holy Spirit helps us understand that it knows and it sees. Someone made the comment um, this morning, actually. Probably it was a farmer. They said, you know, well, I could maybe farm on Sunday as long as Glenn don't see me. I'm like, dude, it doesn't matter what I see. You know, what matters is what God sees. And it doesn't matter if Glenn or one of the elders, maybe I, I won't even say who it was, but, but, but the reality is it doesn't matter what I or any of the elders or anybody else in the church, what we see is only surface stuff. We can only see some of it. God sees to the heart of who we are. You see, the word here, though, that is very important is the word convict. In Greek, it's elancho. That word is a legal term that means to pronounce a judicial verdict by which the guilt of the culprit at the bar of justice is defined and fixed. In other words, the Spirit does not merely accuse men of sin. He brings them to an inescapable sense of guilt so that they realize their shame and their hopelessness before God. That's some heavy stuff, but let me tell you, there's a really key piece here that I want to make us aware of this morning and remind us of. Notice he says to us that he convicts us of sin. He doesn't condemn us. And there's a huge difference there in how we function in life. So many times we walk around and we feel condemnation and that's not what God does to us. He says convicts us. He convicts us. We, we hear we hear people talk about condemnation and, and people sometimes think that even God condemns them for what they do. But God doesn't do that. And let me tell you the difference. The difference between condemnation and conviction is condemnation shows you your problem and offers no hope. Conviction shows you what you're dealing with in your life and offers you a solution. And that's what God does for us. And, and as a people, so often we walk around and we feel condemnation. We walk around like this. We've got the weight of the world on our shoulders and we can't bring our head up and we can't really move because we're so filled with condemnation. That is not from the Spirit of God at all. That is from the Spirit of Satan himself. Conde condemnation destroys us, it kills us, and it keeps us from living life to our fullest. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, when we read about the armor of God, one of the things he reminds us there, he says, is our battle is not with flesh and blood, it's with principalities and powers of this dark world. Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy, and he wants us to live in a state of condemnation. That's what he wants. And there's no hope for that. We walk around like this, and if that's all God had offered to us, we would have to do that. So in John chapter 12, verse 47, he says it like this. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on that last day. For I did not speak on my own but the will of the Father who sent me. And he commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life, so whatever I say is what the Father has told me to say. Condemnation is from Satan himself. It's meant to tear you down. It's meant to destroy you. It's, 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 con it's content to continually point out your failures and your mistakes. It shows you the problem, and it doesn't give you a solution. And that's where Satan wants you to live. In Romans chapter 8, listen as I read these first couple words, these first couple verses from Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, Paul is writing to the church at Rome and he says this, For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Jesus Christ the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. 
So, so what he's telling us is that one of the major jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. And when it convicts us of sin, it is always offering a solution, and that is God's grace as salvation. And when we have that solution, we can live life free. So for myself, there was a, there was a long period of my time early on after I had recommitted my life to Christ when I walked around and all I could think about was condemnation. I, I thought of all the things that I had did when I was running from God and, and the evil and the sin of my life and the mistakes I had made and, and all the things that I had done to tear people down and the, the parties I went to and the people I got to go to parties and, and all the negative stuff I did. And I just kept feeling this weight over and over and over. And Satan's going, oh yeah, oh yeah, I got him right where I want him. Because I felt like there was nothing I could offer. And I always was afraid, whenever I went somewhere, I was afraid that someone would come up and they would say, oh Glenn, I remember when you did X, Y, and Z, and I was afraid of who might hear him say that. That's living under condemnation. And one day God finally got a hold of my heart and he said, Glenn, that's not what I want for you. I came to set you free. In John 10, 10, he says, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly or to the full. He came to make a difference. The Holy Spirit convicts me of sin. God calls me to confess my sin. And in John 1, 9, he says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He came to set me free. And I'm walking around like this with the weight of the world on my shoulder. It doesn't work. And many of us do that. And the Holy Spirit came to convict us of sin. And then he says this. He says, oh, by the way, Glenn, I have a solution to your problem. It's Jesus Christ. That's conviction. Condemnation says, yeah, wait till they find out what you did. And then you're really going to be dirt, buddy. You are going to be nothing. The Holy Spirit takes me away from that and says, Glenn, Jesus came to give you life abundantly. So he, he, in Romans 8, 1 and 2, where he says, for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's saying when we understand and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're set free. That's a huge weight off our shoulder. We can be who he wants us to be. But if we don't confess our sins, if we don't walk in that and live in that life of repentance and living with that, then we're separating ourselves. And he says in that passage from John 16, he says, then we should have guilt and we should have despair because we have brought judgment on ourselves. Who judges? We bring it on ourselves. Or we're set free through the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice, God is not only willing to forgive our sins, but He longs to do that. In fact, He talked about that in Isaiah chapter 30, back in the Old Testament, before Christ ever came. This is what He says in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you, therefore He will rise up and show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for Him. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Conviction always gives us an answer to our problem. It comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus hung on the cross and he looked out across the people and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was his way of dealing with our conviction. He was giving us a solution. He was moving us away from condemnation. Conviction shows us the answer. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not coincidental that this morning we're going to be taking communion. I, we didn't plan this ahead of time. God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, orchestrated it for us to be able to do that this morning in conjunction with this. Christ's body was broken for us and we do this today in remembrance of him because he came to move us from condemnation through conviction to power and freedom. And the blood is a sign of a new covenant. We're set free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's so amazing the gift that God has given us. Condemnation always walks around and says, your past, your past, your sins, you're nobody. I know what you did yesterday. I know what you did the week before. I know, I know. And the Holy Spirit says, I don't remember. If you've confessed it, I don't remember. I don't know. We don't keep track of that. You're set free from that. Live in the freedom of that. 
You see, when we live in that agony of despair, we can never be fruitful. So when Jesus is talking about, in John 14, this gift of the Holy Spirit that comes to set us free, he's talking about being released from condemnation. And that's why he goes from that into John 15 before he finishes talking about the Holy Spirit in John 16. And he says, by the way, if you want to bear a lot of fruit, you got to stay connected to me. And if you stay connected to me, you can bear much fruit. And in the process, you've got to keep pruning the junk away. And what he's saying is in this. He says, we got to be aware that if you want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, you got to get rid of the sin in your life. Period. And you're powerless to do it on your own. But it happens through Jesus Christ dying on the cross. It happens as the Holy Spirit convicts us and leads us into the freedom. Thank God we don't have to deal with that ourselves. Because it's something we can never make a difference in. You see, the Holy Spirit, one of the things He does is He reveals to us our inability to save ourselves. We can't get there. He came to convict us as a sinful, unbelieving world, telling us that we are lost, we're unable to save ourselves. And then as He reveals our sin to us, and as He reveals our shortcomings to us, He reveals to us this great plan of salvation and the amazing grace of God. And God is saying, come, abide with me. And when you abide with me, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit today more than any time of our life. We live in a time and a day when our culture says, do whatever you want, and the Holy Spirit says, no. The world says, do whatever you want, and the Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to life. And Jesus says, come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take, your yoke, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a gift that he offers us. It happens through conviction. You see, we need forgiveness, and... The Holy Spirit's task is to help remind us of our need for conviction. We sometimes talk about that, well, if I just had more of the Holy Spirit, I could make a difference. I, if more of the Holy Spirit came and lived in me, I could live my life fully. That's not true. When you say yes to God, and you confess your sins, and you pour your heart out, He gives you all of the Holy Spirit. What we lack is full surrender. And so what oftentimes prevents us from living more fruitful for God is not the fact that we don't have all of the Holy Spirit. It's because we haven't given Him all of our life. I, I, for myself, that moment when I knelt down in my apartment in Phoenix, Arizona, living a life of sin and destruction and destroying myself, when I cried out to God, I said, Okay, God, as much as I understand of you now, I want all of that in me. I want you to just change my life. I'll do whatever you want, but I won't be a preacher. And, and so for the next years, I struggled immensely in my life because I didn't have full surrender. I had all of the Spirit there, but I kept squelching part of the Spirit, saying, you can't have all of me. And I kept doing this number. No, not quite all of me. No, no, no. And finally I said, okay, God, whatever you want. Here I am. I am a preacher or a pastor or whatever you want to call I don't really care what you call me, just not late to lunch. But, but I know that what changed in my life was when I had full surrender to God it changed my focus and my outlook. Ephesians 5 or 421 says, or 521 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And it's describing to us that we need to have full submission to God. Are you with me? You see, when we live life and we're struggling, one of the first places for us to start to change that is to look back inside and say, okay, God, what have I kept from you? It's usually a sign. It's usually a sign. And that's part of what the Holy Spirit does is to help convict us and lead us to new truths and new life. The second thing I want us to get this morning is the Holy Spirit reveals to us the Father. The Holy Spirit reveals the Father to the believer. You see, the Holy Spirit convinces us of our need to believe. The Holy Spirit reveals the evil of rejecting God's message. So he says in that passage I read, he says, in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. And he's describing to us that when we don't believe in him, we're lost. He helps us understand we need to believe. We've got to cling to the truth. We've got to hold on to the truth. In fact, the truth is all that's left. 
And as we hold on to that truth, it changes things. And he describes in John 14 that it is the spirit of truth that we cling to. And the spirit of truth will reveal all truth to us. Are we willing to submit to that? The spirit, the Holy Spirit reveals the holiness of God. That's part of that revealing the Father to the believer. We see His holiness. He says, in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. He, we can't see Him, but He sees us and He interacts with us. And He says that we, we are, as I, I talked about this last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, He says that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I told you, some have a chapel, others have a cathedral. It's kind of a little pun, a little funny thing. The reality is the Holy Spirit lives here, right here. Everybody do this here. Take your hands up like this here and look up to heaven and say, You, Holy Spirit, live here in me. Wow. Is that scary? It's scary and exciting and powerful all at the same time. The scary part is when I'm doing this number, not all of me, not all of me. Our battle is not with flesh and blood, it's with principalities and powers of this dark world. It's trying to take over. And so when we do this, we're squenching and quelching the Spirit. But when we open up and we recognize it lives in us, and the Holy Spirit is revealing to us the Father, whoa, dude, I've not met him, but I've met him. When I get there, we can talk like we've known each other forever. No kidding. He created us. It says in Genesis 1, it says, In the image of God, He created them male and female. Out of dust of the air, He created them. It says in the Old Testament that He breathed life into the bones. He made all the dry bones come up out of the valley. It is Him who gives us life. And it says, the Holy Spirit is revealing the Father to us so that we can live life fully surrendered to Him. You see, the cross was utter condemnation for Satan. It says this in that passage I read. It says, in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. No hope. Here's what's really important to get that. That word condemned in the Greek is the perfect tense, krakateria or something. I can't really pronounce it. But it means, it's a word that means it is completely settled. It is completely taken care of. It is completely done. In other words, Satan is already under judgment. The sentence is fixed. It is permanent. It will not be changed. He already stands condemned. So when Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, he's recognizing the fact that Satan is doing this. He's trying to get a hold of us, and the Holy Spirit is going, yeah, this is mine. I got him. And we read throughout the book of Revelations, we read throughout the scripture, that we are marked by the beast, or we're sealed by the Spirit. And when Jesus Christ can, becomes our Lord and our Savior, and we have the Holy Spirit living in us, He tells us and reveals to us the Father, and it changes everything. So Jesus says it this way. He says, not only is He convincing us of our present and our future victory, but He's saying, you can do this. You can make it. No matter what you're dealing with today, you can survive with the power of me in you. Verses 12 to 15. This is so awesome. Jesus says, I have so much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. <gasps> really? I haven't even got it all. How much knowledge do you have of God and His Spirit? If it was a salt shaker, you couldn't even make the eggs salty. We have so little understanding. Jesus says, there's so much more I want to tell you but you can't even handle it. You know, it's kind of like sitting at the buffet at a big old barbecue house and you've just had a full rack of ribs, you've had a half a brisket, and you've had a whole bunch of barbecued wings, and you've had all these mashed potatoes and good old bread with some honey butter, and you're eating all this stuff, and you're just loaded to the gills, and it's coming out of your mouth, and there's juice all over your cheeks, and you've got stuff on your shirt, and you're saying, I can't possibly eat anymore, and they bring out another dish, and you set it for you, and you say, you want some more? And you're going, I can't handle it. And God says, you can't handle more of me right now, but I'll give you what you need when you need it. I'll give it to you incrementally as you need it. It's on a time release capsule, and I'm in control of the time, and I'll release it when you need it, and it'll be good. 
When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Now that's a mouthful. He's going to give you what you need when you need it. Whoa. I'm ready for tomorrow. I'm ready for this afternoon. I may have to go to graduation parties, but He's going to tell me what all I have to eat. He's going to tell me who I need to interact with. He can tell me who I'm going to talk to. He can help me be a witness. He can help me be a testimony. He can help me do all the things he wants me to do when there's full surrender. But when I say, no, no, not all of it, then he says, I'm here. I'm knocking on the door. I want to come in. I want to be there. And it changes. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. And all that belongs to the Father is mine. And that's why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In other words, the Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. The Holy Spirit reveals God's glory to us. The Holy Spirit gives us all things. Do you got it? You see, we can't possibly grasp all of it. If you can, you're far wiser than me. Blessings to you. This week... Here's my challenge to you this week. This week, I want you to just be looking at your relationship with God. What are you withholding? What are you doing this summer from? If there's sin in your life, get rid of it. It prevents you from being all you can be in Jesus Christ. Say yes. Recognize he lives here with you. And holiness and unholiness do not live like this. They're like this. But when we confess and we release it back to God, it changes things. As we're here today, we're going to take communion in a few moments. And this communion is to remind us of God's love for us, his body that was broken for us. If it was only broken, it wouldn't mean much. If his body was only broken, we would still be dealing with condemnation. We couldn't move beyond. But he, he not only had his body broken, but his blood was shed as a sign of the new covenant. And then he rose again from the grave so that we may have life abundantly. That's the gift he gives us. And so this morning, I'm going to have a prayer, and then we're, they're going to sing some songs, and we're going to have communion in a bit. As we take a communion, remember that this is God's gift and reminder to us of the life he gives us. Let's pray. God, we, we, we think we know you, and yet we realize that there's so much more that we don't understand. We're reminded of you by your Holy Spirit convicting us of our need to have you in our life daily. God, I know that Satan wants us to live under condemnation and never be able to move forward and just feel awful all the time because of our sin and our wretchedness. And, and I confess to you, God, that I am a sinful man and I live among a sinful people. But God, I also know that I have seen you high and exalted in the train of your robe filling the temple. Your spirit has convicted and offered me the option of life in repentance and forgiveness and grace through salvation in you. And God, as we come here this morning and as we take of communion, we accept that gift that you give to us. God, keep reminding us of how we can share that with our community. Keep reminding us of how we can share that with the world that we live in. God, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, pray.